I am Flynn, I am from DataWire. Everything he said about me is mostly true. We're gonna be talking today about service meshes, what, why, and how. And I realized while putting these together that we actually had left off a really, really important word in that title, what, who, why, and how. Talking about this sort of thing is always important to get into who cares about it, why they care about it, in addition to how you're gonna use it. Just for my own edification starting off, let me get a, well, it's hard to see a show of hands. Show of hands or shout out or something. How many of you would say you're primarily developers? Not a lot, uh-oh. How about operations? Okay, a little more op-centric today. How many of you have no clue you're just trying to get stuff done? That's me most of the time anyway. Um, how many of you have run across service meshes before? Anybody use them? I see a couple of hands, that's good. Anybody care to shout out what they use or if they're still looking? Swarm, Swarm. okay. Anything else? Service Sorry, say again? Service oh, okay. All right, so we've mostly been working with Kubernetes and I'm mostly gonna be using Kubernetes specific terminology to the extent that it fits anything. But everything that I'm talking about here with the mesh, with the, the patterns that you can use with it, it's pretty independent of how you actually get things running. So really quickly, we're gonna hit the what of a service mesh, and then we'll dig into who and why, and then we'll hit how at the end. Depending on how we're doing at time, we'll have a really, really brief demo, but I'm basically gonna be prioritizing questions over the demo if you have questions, let's hear them. The point of a service mesh is that you're taking a bunch of services and collecting them all into something that can work together as a single application. It kind of extends the idea of containers and Kubernetes and things like that. Containers take a bunch of processes and give them a standard sort of interface so that the ops guys can work with them more easily. Kubernetes is about a sort of standardized, sane experience of getting these things to run together. Uh, likewise Swarm and the other things like that. Service Mesh is kind of extending that idea. Um, another thing that's interesting about this is that one of the tricks with the microservices world is that they are distributed applications. And sadly, they come with the complexities of distributed applications. One of the other things that a properly done Mesh can arrange is it can give both development and operations a little bit more of the experience that we had working with a single process monolithic thing where, yeah, they were a pain to develop. It was slow developing them, but we at least tended to have a decent amount of visibility. You had a single process, you could attach a debugger to it, you could go poke at it, and again, a well-designed mesh can let you recover a little bit of that sort of feeling. Maybe not all of it, but some. And that leads us to the question of, why does this stuff matter? Who cares about it? As we talk about that, I'd like you to meet Jane. Jane is the microservices development lead for the Evil Genius Cupcake Company, where the cupcakes are so good, they're evil. She's working on a shiny new application. She doesn't have anybody using it yet. It's just something that she's just started off with. Specifically, the marketing folks have noticed that some of the people who buy Evil Genius Cupcakes really, really like them, and they're off doing all manner of evil things, hoping they get more cupcakes. So they have a user, the user wants to go through and keep track of their evil deeds. The evilness tracker has to save these things in a database, and then eventually somebody, maybe the user, maybe the marketing, will want to go through and read some information about these things. This is kind of the extent that Jane is gonna be thinking, or the, the level at which Jane's probably gonna be thinking about this design. She will probably at some point have to be aware of the fact that it is off running in a container. So she has to think about how people will get access to it, but she doesn't really want to go and dig too far down into the details of it, into the technical stuff. She doesn't want to get involved in yak shaving. Her counterpart, Felicia, is the operations lead for Evil Genius Cupcakes. Felicia has a very different view of the world. Her job, is wrangling all these dozens of microservices plus a legacy, micro, legacy monolith and trying to make some sense of it. I should point out since we're at a DevOps conference that in any reasonable organization these days, these are really roles. 
not necessarily people. Felicia may be doing her own development when she's not on call. Jane may be on call. But at any given point, these people will have a specific role in mind. If Felicia gets called in the middle of the night, she's not going to be thinking about it life as a developer. She's going to be thinking about it as an ops person. This is Felicia's view of her world. She's got a cloud. Inside the cloud, there are a bunch of services running. There's a monolith. And they all talk to each other in ways that may or may not be terribly obvious. When life is good, these things talk to each other. They play nicely. Everything is great. Uh, when they stop, Felicia's phone rings and she has a very bad day. So what does Jane want out of this world? Like we mentioned, she's thinking about this as a business problem. She wants to let people track their evil deeds. She wants that to be straightforward and easy for her. She wants it to be elegant to the sense that when she looks at the code later, she doesn't want to be horribly embarrassed by the hackery she's thrown together. She'd like it to be something she can feel good about. She would like to think about the business problem and not have to go dive down into hideous technical stuff every single minute of the day. Felicia mostly just wants her phone not to ring. But when it does ring, and it will, she wants to be able to quickly figure out what's going on. She wants to quickly get a sense of where the problem is and who she needs to bring in on it. The question is, can a service mesh help them with this? Any guesses? Any opinions? I'm going to vote yes. Can it always help? <laughs> no. Not just no, but uh, heck no. To get a little bit of a sense of why, we can dig into a little bit of what Jane is going to be doing as she's working on this thing. She's going to start off with something that she's pretty much just beating on, trying to make changes to, trying to get running. She doesn't really have any users yet. What does it mean to successfully deploy this thing at this stage of the game? If it doesn't crash, we can call it good at this stage of the game. If it does crash, it just restarts it, no big deal. DataWire calls this one stage one. Probably, she'll fairly quickly get over to a second stage where she actually has real users, real people out in the world trying to use this service. What does a successful deployment mean at this stage? Say again? It can handle the load. Can handle the load. Presumably it works. <laughs> Basically, something that doesn't disrupt her existing users, or at least hopefully doesn't disrupt them very much. She may, depending on what the service is, end up at a third stage where instead of users depending on it, it's users, but also other services within the application depending on it so-called foundational services. What about that? What does a successful deployment mean if her service is one that's foundational? I'm sorry, say again? Well, the biggest thing it means is that we don't have cascade failures. If something goes wrong deploying this service, it needs to not take down the entire application. It needs to be better behaved than that. It's worth pointing out that at any given moment, some services can be in any of these stages. You may have people developing brand new services while there are other ones that are running in production, while there are other ones that are foundational. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that not every service will become a foundational service. Some of them don't need to be. Some of them you get partway through and realize that they weren't really what you wanted to be working on in the first place. So what's Jane likely to be worrying about? Her first worry is probably just going to be to get the thing running locally at all, right? She's going to have some tech stack in mind that she wants to use for this. And that one is a care from stage one all the way up through. 
She's going to need to get running in whatever her cluster is, Kubernetes or whatever. Deployments, replica sets, that sort of thing. Also in stage one. She has to worry about debugging this thing in a cluster environment, which can be a royal pain when you can't really connect to it very easily. People tend to start off with just attaching to it and running shells. And she's going to need to provide access for users. She might use an API gateway for that. She might use the Ingress resource. There's a lot of different things along those lines. Um, I'm going to, if you'll forgive me, a bit of shameless self-promotion. Datawire has things that are intended to make all this stuff easy. Forge and Kubernetes are trying to solve the problem of it being a hassle to get stuff running trivially in Kubernetes. Uh, telepresence for debugging. Ambassador, which you'll hear more about later, for access to users. This is all lumped together under the project Blackbird. There's more on that later. Other things that Jane has to worry about. In addition to the mechanism of being in a place where she can see what's going on, she has to make sure that the stuff is there to look at to debug her service, right? Fortunately, there's this shiny technology called logging. It's been around for a little while. Kind of the core of a lot of what we do for arranging to have the information for debugging available. She has to worry about that, of course, from the very beginning. One of the next things she gets to worry about is being able to safely upgrade her application. A new, she gets a new release ready, she might be doing a canary deployment on this one. Roll out the new version of your service, route some of your traffic over that way, find out whether or not it works. If it does work, life is good. You can route all the traffic that way and then bring down the old one. If it doesn't work, eh, you know, just route the traffic back to the one that's known good and tear down the bad one. Some obvious technologies for that one. She's going to need metrics and built into the service to be able to determine whether it's working correctly. She needs a way to route a request coming in to the new version versus the old version, but not all of them. Any guesses for what stage that she's going to start caring about that? Very good. She doesn't really care until she has new users until she has real users, rather. Before she has real users, she can just tear down the running service, leave it down as long as she wants to, and then bring up a new one. It doesn't matter. But at stage two, once there are real users using this out in the world, you care a lot about this stuff, because you don't want to get in their way. I think somebody earlier mentioned that one of the things Jane is going to care about is whether her service can carry the load. Grace under pressure. Maybe Jane has a friend who's a YouTube star who goes and does a video log about their evil genius cupcake company, and suddenly their traffic goes up by an order of magnitude in an hour. It would be nice if the thing didn't just crumble over and die. There are a bunch of things you can use for this. Um, one of the technologies that can be helpful for this is rate limiting deployed in certain fashions. Where would she start caring about this? Three? I hear a three. Anybody have any other opinions? I think it's two. Um, three is the foundational service where there are other services relying on her. But really, at any given point, once there are real users, then you could end up with a swarm of them that you're not expecting. So have to worry about this a little bit earlier. Um, and of course, as we mentioned, you can be in a situation where the evilness tracker going down takes the entire application down. None of the customers can do anything. That's terrible. That's the sort of thing where you might deploy circuit breakers for it. You might deploy rate limiting in, addition, in a different fashion. And that, as you were mentioning, definitely is the sort of thing that shows up at stage three, unless Jane never has to think about it at all. Maybe this is something where the service mesh can take care of it for her. Felicia's take on this is kind of different. Felicia is going to start off thinking about things in terms of transparency, mostly in the sense of, at any given moment, it would be nice if Felicia can figure out what exactly the whole application is doing. She's going to be relying on the logging and the metrics that Jane builds into the thing in order to do that. 
Felicia will probably start caring about situational awareness. Um, it's a term for the military. People flying fighters with other people shooting at them don't actually have the luxury of stepping outside the cockpit, chilling out for a little while, studying the positioning of everybody on the board, and then getting back into the cockpit to react. They have to do everything very, very quickly. Same thing driving a car, riding a motorcycle, or dealing with an operational failure when a bunch of people are yelling at you because things are broken and the company is losing money. You don't really want to be studying things. You want to be able to just look at something, get an instant sense of what's going on. You want some sort of a good overview of the way the application works in general, of what it's doing. This is the sort of thing that you tend to build atop logging and metrics and such, but it's a pretty different thing. Felicia cares a lot about consistency, both in the sense that she doesn't really want to have to deal with 15 different logging formats, but also in the sense that she'd like to know that things that need to be authenticated are actually authenticated and things that have company policies around them, the policies are being followed. Um, really, the only way you can get that is by making the tools that follow the policies and that create those formats are reusable and available to everybody. If you make it easy for the developers to go through and do the right thing, they tend to do the right thing. If you make it really hard, it tends to happen a lot less. Jane, or Felicia, of course, also cares about grace under pressure. She would really like a lot of this to be happening down in the infrastructures, again, so that the developers can't get it wrong. But in some cases, the developers are going to have to help her out. If you're talking about a canary deployment, it tends to work a lot more usefully if you can decide that the people who get routed to the new version are people who have signed up for the beta program, or people who have otherwise indicated that they're not going to care if things go wrong for a moment. Uh, another one is that all of the metrics that go into figuring out what's going on those are really going to be driven by the business. The ops people are not going to be the ones deciding that. And finally, Felicia is going to care about avoiding prima donna developers. It's the worst thing in the world to tell somebody that, you know, your logging platform, here you go, here's this wonderful library, it's in Java, have a nice day, and then they start whining at you that they want to write in Haskell. The only way to really get around that one is to make all your stuff platform agnostic which is a pretty big ask. So, Felicia actually cares about this pretty much all the time, sadly. If we go from what they care about into how do we make this happen, it's important to recognize, to remember, that Jane's basically trying to focus on solving a business problem. She would rather not constantly get derailed by random little development things. She is a developer, but she would like to be focusing her development energy on things that actually help solve her problem, as opposed to things that are a hassle that are unrelated to her problem. Felicia would like to be paying attention to the application as a whole without getting sucked into every little piece of the development world every time. You can use technology to help get both of these people what they want, but it turns out to be a really hard problem. And for why it's a really hard problem, let's look a little bit into a particular technology we talked about earlier, circuit breaking. So, this is Felicia's view of the application. We're gonna take a look at one particular chunk of it. And as we take a look at that one particular chunk, it's really, the monolith might be talking to any of the instances, in this case, three instances of this particular service. Circuit breaking is the idea that if one of those services just randomly dies, you do this radical thing and you don't talk to it. There are two other instances of that service. Let them give you answers that are good. After a while, you can try to talk to it again. See if it's up. If it's not, no big loss. Just don't talk to it for a little while longer. If it is up, of course, you can put it back into the rotation. Pretty simple to describe. If you actually look at what you have to do to make this happen, though, you have to start off by keeping track of which instances are part of the service. Obviously, you have to keep track of which one is dead, 
but you also have to keep track of when it died so that you can keep track of how long to wait before you try it again. You probably need some sort of exponential back off because you don't, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to keep trying this thing every second. Try it a second, then try it two seconds, who knows. You have to actually implement the retry logic, which includes understanding what it means for this service to be healthy. It could easily be the case that it will answer your connection and give you an answer, but that the answer is utterly wrong. And there may be business logic going along with deciding whether you should trust it that goes beyond whether it's actually up. You have to keep track of whether or not new instances have spontaneously appeared for this service. And you have to keep track of whether any of them have gracefully bowed out as opposed to just dying when you didn't expect it. So this one particular thing, which is fairly simple to describe, is not at all simple to implement. And of course, it's only one of the technologies there. Rate limiting brings it its own set of complications. Even things like logging and metrics, once you start digging into how do you actually do them as opposed to how you actually describe them, as so many things go in computing, as soon as you start dealing with the real world, the details get to be really, really nasty. So, Trusting the individual Janes of the world to get this right 100% of the time in all situations, all the time, forever, is basically a non-starter. No, that is no commentary on Jane's skills. That's commentary on what we as human beings can actually do. The easy way to deal with this is to take all this hard stuff and move it down into the infrastructure. The same paradigm we follow with operating systems, device drivers, all this kind of stuff. You get it right once, let everybody use it, and your life will be easier. This is what the service mesh is really all about, this idea that you could take all of this nasty stuff, push it down so that the developers don't have to constantly re-implement the wheel and then run with it. This, of course, raises the question of how you actually make one. There are several ways to go. There are always several ways to go. Uh, data wire is kind of biased. We happen to like Envoy, open source project that originated with Lyft. And we kind of especially like Envoy when you stick Ambassador or Istio on top of it. This is Envoy. URL is there. It's just accepted into CNCF, which is kind of cool. Uh, it's, at a very high level, it's a smart reverse proxy that can operate both at layer four and layer seven simultaneously. It was built from the ground up in C++ to make HTTP2 and gRPC first-class citizens. It's one of the only things that actually properly handles HTTP2 tra trailers for gRPC, for example. Uh, it was built at Lyft. It ran there for a couple of years in production before they open sourced it. So to say that it has been battle tested is something of an understatement. It handles a brutal amount of traffic right now. And this is how you can use it. We'll go back to our Felicia I view of the world here. Um, arranged to have a little bit more room to play with. Everybody's probably familiar with the reverse proxy pattern, right? You have a load balancer at the edge of your cluster that allows people from outside your cluster access to inside. You stick a reverse proxy behind that. You let people outside talk to your reverse, prox reverse proxy and make queries. Those queries get interpreted by the proxy. The proxy decides which of the services to talk to and forwards the request on. Worth noting, not all of the services have to be exposed to the outside world. Uh, also worth noting that in this case, we've got the reverse proxy set up so that the monolith is behind the reverse proxy. Some people do it differently, it doesn't really matter. Now, you don't really have to stop with a dumb reverse proxy here. You can add a bunch of extra smarts into it. You can put in routing that can be dynamically updated or that can be dependent on who you know, like can look at a cookie, figure out who the user is, and decide where to route based on that. You can put in authentication and authorization into the proxy. You can put in logging hooks and statistics gathering things. You do all of that, you get something that is not really a reverse proxy anymore. Now it's an API gateway. This is basically the Ambassador product. And the way Ambassador works 
is that we use Envoy for the reverse proxy, stick the, little, stick the ambassador code next to it, teach the ambassador code how to go and look into a bunch of config maps in Kubernetes to figure out how it's supposed to be doing routing, what other features it's supposed to be enabling. Ambassador can go and configure the Envoy and all as well. Like I just said, API Gateway from DataWire. Um, it's important to note that Envoy is actually doing all the heavy lifting there, so you get all the performance wins and all the battle testing stuff. The main thing from Ambassador is that if you go and look at how to set up Envoy, it's not the most trivial thing in the world to do by hand. And so Ambassador ends up introducing a simpler and much more opinionated idea about configuration to make it easier to do the easy things and still make it possible to do some of the hard things, most of the hard things really at this point. Um, one example of a way in which Envoy is easy to get wrong is that when you're defining routes in Envoy, uh, they're actually order dependent. And if you end up putting the wrong one first, very, very unexpected things can happen. Ambassador could handle that on its own. When I say simpler and more opinionated, that's a complete example of all the information you need to do a request route in Ambassador. So basically, Ambassador is kind of a light version of a service mesh. But the interesting thing is that once you have this idea that you stuffed a bunch of this complex logic down into what used to be a proxy and turn it into something smarter, you don't have to stop with this configuration. You can put envoys everywhere. It is light enough weight and high performance enough that you can literally stick an envoy next to every running instance of your services. And at this point, you can do all sorts of interesting things like you can allow the envoys that are running next to some of the services to be following different rules about circuit breaking or rate limiting or routing than the one running out there at the edge of the cluster. Uh, if you are careful about keeping them all in sync, then the whole cluster can both respond to routing changes, but also not have to do things like hand requests all the way back to the edge to be reproxied. They can handle it locally. They can gather statistics from all the places in, throughout your entire mesh, feed it all into a central aggregator. There's a bunch of really cool stuff you can get with this. This is basically the Istio project. Another open source thing, this one out of IBM and Google, partnering with Lyft. They got a ton of developers working on it. One of the things that's cool about this one is that in order to deal with the whole platform agnostic thing, it's all about sidecars rather than libraries. You stick a running Envoy next to each of these services, and then actually Istio uses IP tables magic to force all the traffic through the Envoys. Um, the end result is that you never get the Haskell problem. Right? You don't have to worry about whether or not your client libraries have been updated to the latest and greatest in any given platform. Huge win there. Um, also worth pointing out that Ambassador plays nicely with this one and that you can stick an Ambassador in front of an Istio cluster and kind of get the best of both worlds there. So at that point, the way this one kind of works is that Istio ends up putting a little bit, co little bit of code next to an Envoy, but they actually do that for all of the Envoys in the cluster. And then they have this thing called Pilot, Istio is the Greek word for sale, so most of their terminology draws on nautical terms. So they've got this thing called Pilot. Pilot ends up able to look at the various configuration resources that go along with Istio, and then it can update all of the envoys all at once and keep them all in sync. Uh, Istio also has a thing called a mixer that is sort of an escape hatch for insanely complex application-specific stuff. So, basically the point of the service mesh is that you're trying to give both Jane and Felicia the things that they want. You're trying to do it in a way that's sane, in a way that's consistent from application to application, from service to service. 
Um, and you're trying to do it in a way that's easy for everybody to actually use, for everybody to actually do the things that you'd like them to do. Some of the obvious things that you can put in here are routing, logging. There's a bunch of metrics you can do there. You can gather them into a single aggregated spot. You can do circuit breaking and rate limiting down at the infrastructure layer rather than having to re-implement it for every service. You can centralize authentication and authorization. It's kind of a nice win. Um, again, the point is get it right once, let everybody use it. Don't make people reinvent the wheel constantly. There are things it cannot do that a service mesh will not help you with. It is not going to make everything an ops problem so the developers in the world don't get to just pretend that it's somebody else's issue and they don't have to think anymore. Um, some kind of specific things on this that we mentioned, for example, the canary deployments. It, it's a good idea to be able to pick users that make sense from a business point of view to route over to the new version first. Um, it's also a good idea to be thinking about the business logic behind the metrics and behind the determination of whether a given canary is actually still breathing or whether it's being poisoned. Um, likewise, the mesh is not gonna turn everything into the developer's problem. There is still going to be a need for people in the operations role where if something goes sideways, then that's not the time to be digging into a particular service first. The first thing that you're gonna to need to do is to get a sense of how the entire application is going wrong and then direct your efforts that way. Another thing that's worth pointing out is that going immediately to a full-blown service mesh may be overkill until you have some of the services at stage three. You can actually get a really long way by putting an API gateway in front of your stuff and starting that way, starting out by using the sort of light version of the mesh to go through and get some benefit from this thing without going through all of the pain of bringing up the whole thing. Uh, some really good examples of this one are routing and authentication. It's actually really nice to be able to centralize authentication into one place and know that if a service gets the request, if it needed to be authenticated, it was. Very handy. And you get some of the simpler mesh functions. You can do some centralized logging and centralized stats with just that part too. It's, in a lot of ways, can be thought of as a place to stand as you're going through and starting off with some of this common stuff. And then as you need it, it's usually easier to go from there onto the full mesh than to just do it all at once. Uh, full disclosure. I work on Ambassador, I am therefore biased. Seems to be working out so far though. The conc in conclusion after all of this, the first thing to take away here is that it's all about the users. It's all about the people trying to use this as opposed to trying to create the thing. Our job as developers is not to make our own lives easier, it's to make the lives of the users easier. Sad but true. Meshes can be a really handy tool for this, although they are not a silver bullet. They never will be. Pretty much nothing will be, sadly. And it's worth remembering again, the full-blown mesh might be overkill at first. There may be a way you can start with just the API gateway and then have a way to move forward onto the full mesh. And as I mentioned before, as we've looked around at some of these things, we kind of like Envoy and Ambassador and Istio for doing these things. It's worked out really well for us. But if you're gonna take one thing away from this, this would be the one. Don't forget that. Any questions? All right. There's the Blackbird stuff for anybody who wants to see it. I'll put that back up later, but in the meantime, Let's see about showing a couple of things here.
All right. So this is a Kubernetes cluster that is, this is actually gonna be kind of interesting doing this with the windows on the side. But this cluster is running Ambassador and Istio and a bunch of demo services. Um, and what we're looking at over there is just the set of pods that are currently running. You can see the ambassador pods. Let me see if that's gonna be a little bit more legible. Um, a pod is a thing that is running a container, mostly. <laughs> you can actually have a single pod running multiple containers. Um, it's actually a better analogy might be a virtual machine. Um, and I'm waffling a lot here because Kubernetes actually has nodes, deployments, replica sets, pods, containers, uh, and it's turtles all the way down. Uh, but yeah, you can think of it, think of a pod as a virtual machine in this case that's executing one or more containers. Um, I'll also plug my colleague, Phil, who's gonna be talking about Kubernetes tomorrow. All right, hopefully that's a little easier to read though. Now, That's the configuration that Ambassador is using right now. Um, there is an external authentication service running, so everything that comes into the Ambassador at the beginning of this, at the edge of the cluster, gets passed through an external authentication service that decides whether or not it needs to be authenticated, and if it does, does it. Uh, if their authentication fails, then the Ambassador kills the connection before handing it off to the service. If it succeeds, then it goes ahead and hands it off to the service. Um, that bit with allowed headers there is letting Ambassador know that if the authentication service supplies that XQOTM session header, then that header needs to be passed on through to the service itself. The other things in here are mappings. So if you get something whose URL starts with QOTM down here. Yeah, that is the right one. Then it gets handed off to the QOTM service, which is the quote of the moment service. If it starts with reviews, it gets handed to reviews, but it's reviews version one. Um, Ambassador actually covers ordering all these things properly so that they work. So uh, let me also do this. I'm sorry, say again? So for the prefix, um, there it hasn't been any new mapping associated with the URL. Right. Is there some kind of other signal associated with the URL? You mean the thing that determines where QOTM goes as a service name? Yeah. Yeah, Kubernetes does an internal DNS service. So Kubernetes itself keeps track of which pods and which instances are running the QOTM service and then populates in its internal DNS with that. So you can just refer to things, its full name is something like qotm.default.cluster.kubernetes or something along those lines. Awesome. All right. We actually have quite a few services. Oh, actually, you know, let me, let me be more clear about this since there was a question about pods. A Kubernetes service is actually a mapping that is telling the Kubernetes cluster that some pods are running containers that are prepared to answer for a given service name. The pod is the thing running the code. So you can absolutely create a service that has no pods behind it and you won't really be able to do a lot with it, but one thing you can do with it is, for example, 
use it to set up your DNS to go through and do TLS termination and things like that. But when I ask Kubernetes to get me the services, then it shows this huge batch of things, some SDO stuff, some uh, ambassador itself, things like that. If I then turn around and ask it to show me the pods, it actually gives me something of a smaller set, but you can see that there's one ambassador service there, but two ambassador pods, so that if one of the ambassador pods dies, the other one can take over. Um, likewise, we have reviews version one and reviews version two running at this particular moment, because sometimes it can take a really long time for Kubernetes to pull down a Docker image and spin up a container, and I didn't really want to wait for it. Um, there's only one QOTM service running. This is one of the things that's a little bit weird about Kubernetes if you haven't gotten used to it. But if we go back here and we ask for the ambassador service in particular, my laptop is not in this cluster. So from my laptop's perspective, I have to talk to the external IP. And if I were going to do this for, with TLS, for example, I would need to uh, use that external IP, set up a DNS name pointing to it, get a certificate based on the DSS, DNS name and all that crap, which is, why, which is why it can be very important to follow the distinction between a pod and a service for that. But if I do this, oh good, we were actually able to get something through it. That's always nice. Uh, I can actually open this in a web browser because that is a web page. And it will give me this page. Um, for those of you who try this on your own at home with the Istio stuff, this is actually the Istio book info demo running right now. Okay. Under the hood, these are coming from the reviews service and the rest of it is coming from the product page service and there's turtles all the way down again. Another thing we can do though is having actually generated some traffic we can look at this Grafana thing, and we can see once it reloads. Come on, Wi-Fi, you can do it. Yeah, so you can see that Grafana is showing us that there have been some requests made, and they've gotten good results, and this is all very nice. Uh, if anybody is curious as to whether I'm faking the whole thing, That's not right. Okay, typing while looking sideways is really hard. Quick, where's my mistake? Nicely done, sir. As we say in software, never precede a demo with a comment more predictive than, watch this. <laughs> All right. There we go. So yes, I am actually sending traffic over here. And yes, HTTP IE is a Python program, so it can't do very many requests per second. This is not the fault of the Kubernetes cluster. Just want to get that out there. All right. Now, I'd like you to remember this, looking at that graph and you know, looking at the demo and all that stuff. Um, another interesting thing is that HTTP IE doesn't actually uh, die when you control C it in that loop, which I found really entertaining the first time. So, another thing we can do is, we already brought up reviews version two. If I come back here, and I ask for the pod list. And you can see that I have reviews v1 and I have reviews v2 running. I can change the configuration mapping my reviews. For the record, I don't use vi except in demos. Hmm. 
Let's point this instead at reviews v2. The reason I do use VI in demos is that it's a nice way to make sure that you're not totally confusing everything with opening new windows and such. All right. The way Ambassador works in this mode is it's paying attention to this config map called Ambassador Config, very creatively named, I know. And this is the hideous Kubernetes idiom for I want to update this config map in place. Um, there are things about Kubernetes I really, really like. Mostly that it does a pretty nice job of making it fairly straightforward and predictable to bring a bunch of services together and let them cooperate. But man, oh man, its command line is not one of the things I like. Kind of reminds me of Git. Now, we're going to force a redeployment of Ambassador. We're using the Kubernetes deployment machinery to affect configuration changes in Ambassador. The idea here is that if you're running code in an environment whose job is orchestrating containers and orchestrating pods, then there are some real advantages to treating configuration as immutable and then just triggering a redeploy when you need to change it. Uh, one of the earlier versions of Ambassador did not do that. We had a long running process that would go and make a bunch of changes and such. And it, um, this way is better. All right. So now if we go through and we reload our web page here, we should see something different. Look at that. Reviews version two has stars on the page. Ooh. Now, if we wanted to, actually, let's just go ahead and do it. We're going to delete a deployment in Kubernetes is a description to Kubernetes about uh, basically here's a Docker image or a set of Docker images that I want you to run in containers inside of a pod. I want to have three of them running at all times. I want you to do a rolling update when I change anything about the description. And you're basically letting the machinery of Kubernetes handle all that junk for you rather than doing it all by hand. So what I just did there was to delete the deployment for reviews v1 entirely. If I now come back and get pods, then you can see that it's marked terminating. I actually have a watch running over here. So yeah, now it's gone. And if I go back to Chrome, nothing happens because I'm talking to reviews v2. Taking down reviews v1 is no big deal. All right, almost done with the demo. One other thing I want to show you, though, is the quote of the moment. It's a very profound service. The quote of the moment is a service that my colleague Phil wrote that you can request a bizarre and existential quote from it. Um, if we repeat this, then we'll get one of a set of bizarre and existential quotes. If we ask for a specific quotation, though, the, uh, you remember I said Ambassador was talking to an external authentication service? The external authentication service is designed such that it requires authentication for anything starting with QOTM slash quote, because you see you can also push quotes using this thing, and that's not something you should be able to do on your own, or just anonymously. So if I do that, I get a 401. If I feed it, though, the super secure credential of username, password, it helps if I spelled password correctly, though, huh? Sigh. It'd help if I remembered which program I was running. There you go. So that works. Now, the other thing I'd like to show you, though, is I would like to show you the source code for the quote of the moment. And before I do that, let me point out also that if I come over here in Grafana, then we can see, you know, we can see the 401 that I got. We can see the successful 200s. 
we're basically seeing a fair amount of information about what's going on in here. I haven't customized this graph at all. It's literally just the first thing that opened up. If I bring over the source code for the quote of the moment, um, yeah, that's pretty much all of the relevant thing. Um, that function up at the top there is the one that responds if I just say, you hit the URL and have it get me a random quotation. And the one at the bottom is the one for asking for a specific quotation by numeric ID. Uh, and what do you not see in this code? Remembering that we just saw it deny us because we were unauthenticated. There's not a single thing about auth in that code. There's also not a single thing about logging. All of that's being handled by the infrastructure underneath the application. Likewise, the routing from reviews v1 to v2 that you saw, uh, the review service doesn't have anything. I'm not gonna show you the code for that one because it is in Java and it wouldn't fit on the screen. Um, oh, actually, that's a good point. Um, the book info demo and quote of the moment between them cover uh, Ruby, Java, and Python and they're all using the same infrastructure with no client libraries. Unless you count Flask as a client library, you know. So all of that, the request routing, the authentication, the logging, all of that is stuff that we push down into the infrastructure to let anybody use and let anybody use in the same way. And you end up with stuff like this that works and can be changed on the fly as you like. That's the goal. Um, that's it for the demo. There's a ridiculous amount more that you can do with the combination of Ambassador on top of Istio on top of Envoy. But this, will, this is it for now. That gives you a little bit of a taste. Um, I will be around for at least a few minutes for questions. Come on up, say hello. Thanks very much. I appreciate it.